What's going on guys? Today I want to finally talk about the stack that I use to build my startup, InsiderViz. InsiderViz is an online platform for insider trading, visualizations, and data processing. And my friends and I have built it over, I think it took us about six months. We started building it in May, conceived the idea about a year ago. I want to break down all the tools, all the services, all the languages, everything we use to construct it from the ground up. We custom wrote everything, and hopefully this can help you if you're trying to build something like that. And before we get started, make sure you subscribe. Throughout all of November, I will be uploading something every single day, trying to grow as much as we can, really give this a shot. At the end, I'm going to be making a full documentary documenting what I did every day, how the growth went, everything we learned, and yeah, I think it's going to be pretty cool. Subscribe to join up, let me know what you think, if you have any feedback, leave it below. And without further ado, let's get into the stack. Alright, so the first thing I want to talk about is the backend stack. This is what I primarily developed. I worked on this in a team of four. So I worked with my best friends from high school, we went in, built this out. I did all of the backend work, so what you see here is kind of my area of expertise. So the language of choice was Golang. This has gone through an insane number of iterations. I have built this in... Let's see, Kotlin, Python, JavaScript, TypeScript, C Sharp one time, Go like three times, and we finally settled on Go. There was a lot of learning that went into this, and in the end I chose Go, and that's mostly because of its performance as a web server. Go has really easy to use concurrency, it's extremely powerful, extremely fast, and it was just perfect for our choice. And then in the end we went with the database of MongoDB. I actually initially built this using SQL for the backend, so storing all the forms in SQL. And it worked, it was okay, but it actually, MongoDB ended up making more sense because if you think about what our data is, it truly is just documents. So storing them document-wise and then being able to use MongoDB's aggregation pipeline, which is so slept on. So many people should be implementing that into your stacks. If you haven't seen what you can do with it, let me just show you an example real quick. We go to insiderviz.com, our site, and we go to this sector section. On this page, you see all this data. This is the result of one aggregation from MongoDB. All of this data came out of one aggregation, and I think we did it over five, 600,000 documents, something like that, and it happens in a less than 500 milliseconds. It is so freaking good what you can do with this. The grouping, the summing, the act, it's, it's just all there. Highly recommend giving it a shot, very slept on. So, sort of breaking down what our backend consists of, we have two major services that run on the backend. The first is a cron job. So, to actually fetch the forms that we display to the end users, those obviously have to be fetched. So, we get all of our data directly from the SEC itself, and they expose public RSS feeds and a public XML directory, or a public directory with XML files in it. We're able to read all of those ourselves, and this cron job, effectively what it does, fetches all the forms, and then it will save them into our MongoDB instance. Then we have another um, project on our back end, and this is our REST API, which is what actually sends the forms down to our client. And the reason why we wrote this in Go instead of just directly connecting to the back end in our next server, which I'll talk about later, is because we're able to get higher performance by leveraging concurrency. Some of the different pages we need require us to pull from like six different collections that are completely unrelated. So like doing it as like a SQL join and reorganizing our data wouldn't really make any sense. They're very separate data sets. So being able to run those concurrently and then do aggregations on them afterwards while still leveraging concurrency in a language like Go, which is already substantially faster than TypeScript, really made a huge difference. So that's why we ended up going with Go for our backend. We use the Fiber framework. Uh, it's just fast. Fiber will Fiber massively outperforms Mux and Jin, and I didn't really feel like rolling a custom HTTP server. Using all the benefits of a framework and the middleware and all that, it's just... I wanted to use it. it, makes it life a lot easier. And then finally, the hosting, MongoDB Atlas, I mean, it's built by the company that makes MongoDB. It's really fast, it's really great, Atlas search is phenomenal, the user experience is phenomenal, support's great. I have no issue with this, very happy using it. And then I actually host these two, the cron job and the REST API. These are actually hosted on Railway. And I think it's a testament to how powerful Go is. We have huge amounts of users and we never we don't go past the free tier for either of these. That's also because of some of the architecture decisions we made for the front end, which I'll talk about in a second. But Railway just makes these hosting these two so incredibly easy that it's just a no-brainer. Now let's talk about the front end. This, I did a lot of the work on the front end, but all of the really cool visualizations you see, all these custom graphs, these are made, I did not make those. Those are made by my friends. Uh, they can talk more about that. But 
What I can tell you is that they were custom written, they're custom SVGs, and then they used the D3 library to custom animate them. So there was no package importing here. We didn't just like use React tables or something. We custom built these. And I think that's part of why they look so good and they work so well, it's because they're custom. So our front end stack is pretty much just Next.js. We, when we were architecting the site and developing it, we sort of had two separate data sets. We have the forms on one end and then we have the users on the other. The front end is entirely responsible for managing the users. So what you see right here is a sort of breakdown of our Next.js app. This is one project, but I split these two up to sort of illustrate the separation of concerns and show you that we connect them up with TRPC. So our main front end, so like this whole monolith is being connected to our backend forms API via REST versus these two, our client app and our client server are actually being connected with TRPC. TRPC is a library for, um, well, it's TypeScript RPC effectively. So it allows you to call backend functions as, well, a function and it wraps React query. It makes managing users, managing tables, managing um, authentication, that sort of thing, way, way, way easier and way more pleasant. So naturally we implemented it. So then for our two sides, we have the client app, obviously. When you go to insiderviz.com, this is the client app. Everything you see here is written in React um, in a Next app. And then our server back here is what's responsible for our authentication, our uh, Stripe integrations, all that stuff is handled by the client server. So then as far as the language goes, obviously it's TypeScript. If you're writing Next.js without TypeScript in 2022, you're doing it wrong. Just use TypeScript, it makes your life so much easier. It makes it a real usable language. Um, our database of choice was SQL. MongoDB is great and I'm, I'm a MongoDB apologist. I know a lot of people don't like it, but personally, I really believe in MongoDB and I think it does have a place, but its place is not user management. And I have a full video breaking that down. I think it's like here or something, I don't know. Um, but regardless, it, SQL made so, SQL makes a hundred times more sense for managing users. R relating a user to their like profile and then relating that profile to their selected companies for the subscription, all of that just makes so much more sense than like setting up nested MongoDB tables and then having to like go through and query out the nested arrays. It's just, it doesn't work. So we use SQL naturally. And then our authentication solution, just next off, it's lightweight, easy to use, no brainer. And for our hosting, Vercel, they built Next. They have a phenomenal hosting provider for Next. You can't go wrong there. And PlanetScale is the our database provider of choice. I've talked about them before, and I want to do a full breakdown on how they actually work. Their architecture of treating a database like a Git repo is super cool. And I think a lot of people sleep on that sort of DX that you get. Setting up a local like development testing database that mirrors prod but isn't prod is more annoying than you think and especially getting that across a full team to where we all have identical environments kind of sucks. But when I can have a dev branch where all of our devs go in and we manage everything in there and then as soon as we make a release we can test it in the first cell staging environment and then once it's staged and passes all the builds we can then merge both of those into prod. So we merge our database schema into prod and we merge our app into prod. And it just it feels good it makes a lot of sense and i'll do a full breakdown of that later so next we have our services these are the external things that sort of make our app run uh for our payments it's stripe don't roll your own payments that's stupid uh use stripe or some alternative i truthfully i don't know of any alternatives to stripe if they exist great but stripe works great they have excellent integrations with uh, javascript especially writing uh stripe into your typescript application is free Works great, handle all our payments, good stuff. Uh, Twilio SendGrid, this is our email provider. Uh, part of our service is A, we have a mailing list, so every week we write new articles about insider trading, sort of break it down, and then send those out to everyone on our mailing list. And SendGrid was just the natural choice for that. Well supported, very large, great API, no concerns there. And then Google AdSense, we had to make money somehow. So Google AdSense is our sort of monetization pipeline of choice. Um, and then obviously we have the subscriptions as well. This is something we're kind of debating internally, and I sort of actually want to talk about this in the future. The way B2C sort of, the way B2C financials work and the way the subscriptions work and how like the ad money would scale versus the subscriptions, it's kind of fascinating. And I think in the end, this will probably be our primary monetization strategy, but that's left to be seen. For now, 
it's the ad provider we use, very easy to set up, no issues there. So finally, I wanna just kind of bring this all together and show you a high level view of what all of our architecture looks like. So if you just took Insider Viz and blew it up and looked down, this is what you would see. So I'll, I guess the best way I can do this is to just show you what um, the kind of a life cycle of a form. The insiders will file a trade with the SEC, gets loaded into the Edgar API from the SEC, and then we fetch it via the RSS feed and then parse the XML in our Golang cron job. This cron job will then save to our MongoDB database, then our forms API will query out of that database to get all those forms that we, that we parsed and saved, and then it will send them down to our next server via a REST API. Then this REST API, the data we get in here will now be sent down to our front end client via TRPC and React query. The reason we use TRPC is because we have to use this proxy anyway, because since we're doing this data fetching stuff, we need to use an API key because we don't want people just randomly using our API without us knowing. So we lock it behind an API key. We can't expose that on the client because then you could just inspect element, see our API key and bam, our API is hacked. So we have to hide it on a server, which is why we have to kind of proxy these requests through here. And then we just use TRPC for caching and all that stuff. Makes life really easy. And then our front end code is super simple. Reading it out of a function, have easy loading states, and then display it out in the graphs. Now over here, we have the sort of other side of it. And this, uh, next, this next server will handle the user management stuff as well. So if we're on the client and a user goes to say the, um, they go to the feedback page and they submit some feedback. That will be sent up to the next server and then it will say, okay, this is a database write. And it'll write this to our SQL database, which is hosted on planet scale. So all of our user stuff happens over here. Then whenever someone needs to check out or there's like a payment event or they cancel something or subscribe to something, that is communicated via a REST API to send stuff to Stripe and then Stripe will send us events via webhooks. Uh, the entire Stripe eco ecosystem is built around webhooks and a lot of different things when you're building your business, you want to use a provider for it. You shouldn't make your own mailing server. You shouldn't make your own auth provider. You shouldn't make your own framework, that sort of thing. But what you should do is you should understand Stripe. Don't buy a like Stripe wrapper thing that will just handle it for you. Stripe is entirely built around webhooks and you need to understand that layer because if you don't understand that layer and that layer breaks, you are screwed. Your app will not work, your payments will not fulfill, users will buy something and then they won't get their product fulfilled and that will lead to massive headaches and a lot of issues for you down the line. So make sure you really understand these web hooks and how all of that works. And finally, we've got SendGrid. SendGrid, we just, whenever we need to send out emails, we send a request up to SendGrid, it will load all our content in, ship it out to our mailing list, which is stored in the SQL database. That's pretty much it. That's a very kind of brief breakdown of what I used to build our SaaS. This was architected over the course of about six months. Um, it was our first real attempt at this, but what we built out here, I'm very happy with. I think that these are really solid tools. And if I were to go and build another startup tomorrow, this is the sort of thing I would use. I think Go has be, really become the ultimate backend language. For a serious backend that's doing more than reading and writing users out of a table, you cannot go wrong with Go. Easy concurrency, crazy performance, excellent user experience, and a massive growing community. It just can't be beat. But then when we get into this other half of things, the next ecosystem is phenomenal. Next.js 13 looks great. I'm very excited for it. Next Conf was cool. Um, I'm going to talk about that more in the future, but the whole JavaScript ecosystem has really grown a lot over the last few years, and it's really become... You can build a full app just using this stuff. We have a unique solution that requires this more complicated backend, but this stuff over here, this Next.js, TRPC, Planet Scale, Stripe, uh, next off and send grid you can build whatever you want with that you're really only limited by your imagination so i hope this helps you out if it does let me know down below thanks for watching have a great day